Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Priscilla Brown. I am the um, Executive Director of Professional Learning at Illuminate Education, and I'm really grateful to be here with you today. Um, this spring, I know that our lives have been turned upside down. If you're like most people I know, both your professional and personal life have been gr impacted greatly by this pandemic. Our students are experiencing exactly the same thing. We know that their lives are less predictable than ever. Their days that were once structured with schedules and challenging and engaging work likely look vastly different. And as educators, we're doing the very best we can to shift to virtual supports and education. I've been amazed by the ingenuity and persistence I've seen by educators I've been working with. I've had the chance to talk with various educators who aren't giving up on students and are showing them that we're here for them, we care about them, and we really wanna help them continue to learn. Um, every teacher I've interacted with during this time has mentioned students who continue want to want to do more work and ask for more. Um, they crave the challenge, routine, and learning that we provide. Um, in late March, when we started hearing the term COVID slide, I immediately started exploring what educators are doing to prevent that slide. We're excited to spend some time today exploring ways to use data to find students who need to be engaged and provide ideas for what that engagement may look like. This quote stood out to me when I saw it recently in an article um, that really, I think, sums up what we're talking about today in terms of preventing the COVID slide with universal screening data and additional information. So we know our spring has changed. Um, that's obviously probably quite an understatement. Um, across much of the country, our school buildings have closed, but that doesn't mean that learning has stopped. We know that there are three primary ways we've seen learning shift this year. So first, some schools have completely closed and teachers are no longer working with students. Um, school has kind of finalized for the 1920 school year. In many schools, learning is occurring Teachers are engaging with their classes and work is ungraded and attendance is optional. And so in these cases, we hear about teachers doing really creative things to get students to choose to participate. Typically in these settings, educators are reviewing previously taught standards and skills and are working with students in both large and small groups. And then in some schools, attendance is expected and the work students are doing is graded. So some schools are operating on a similar schedule as they did when school was held in a building while others have vastly different schedules than they did when, when learning was happening in a building. Um, and in, these, in this type of setting, um, teachers are progressing in their curriculum standards and are teaching new skills to students. So um, either way, if you're in a school where participation is optional or required, formative assessment is as important as ever. So when teachers can't see students completing their work in the same room as them, having access to data to determine students' needs is really essential. And so when we think about screening in a remote environment, many of you may be having discussions deciding whether or not to, spring, to screen students this spring. Um, I encourage you to consider both why you may screen and how you would use the data in these discussions. So let's dig a little bit more into that. So schools are, that are completing screening are doing so because they aren't seeing students in person and they really want access to data that they've used in the past to provide them with critical information. So they've been using screening data in the fall and winter and they want continued information to help them um, understand where students are currently at with important skills um, and grade level preparation. So they need the, these data for the purpose of preventing the COVID slide. Having those screening data allow educators to find students who've made no growth since the winter and allow us to give these students increased attention. And that'll be the majority of our discussion throughout this webinar today. In addition to hearing this from educators, um, we, this seems to be a nationwide trend. So in a recent Ed Week survey, teachers were asked the most challenging part of their job when working virtually. Their most common response was this, difficulty in knowing if students are learning or if they need more help. Um, and that had the highest response on that survey um, with 58% of those surveyed responding um, specifically with that. And so obviously when we're not seeing students in person, it's more challenging to see which skills that we're discussing and which skills that they're practicing are challenging to them and, um, and where, they're, where they're performing. So knowing that, we believe that spring screening data can really support this need. As with all assessment, we use spring screening data for multiple reasons. So it serves 
several purposes in schools. And if you've been using screening in the past, you can probably think of right away why and how you use screening data. Um, at, to this year, your spring screening data may take on, may serve different roles. And so you may not be using those screening data to do some things you have in the past. You may not be using it to support your special education child find or evaluation efforts, for instance. Because of the change in learning expectations for all students, it may be challenging to use screening data for those high stakes decisions. Um, in your school, you may, maybe you're not using it to group students for instruction now or in the fall because your class structures are vastly different. And, um, and the same within grade grouping that you've done in the past may not apply. Um, however, while we're in virtual learning environments, you may find screening data really valuable at identifying students whose learning has plateaued so that you can act now to prevent um, any further plateau or a slide. So we'll shift now to discussing how you can use spring screening data to identify students who may need additional supports with John and then Rachel will discuss strategies to engage students whose learning appears to have plateaued. I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Sarah. And as Sarah said, I'm John and I serve as the Director of Research and Development for FastBridge. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to help you use your FastBridge data this spring to evaluate student learning and, the, and to understand the effects of the disruption to instruction on their learning. When the COVID crisis struck U.S. schools, the focus naturally was on establishing distance learning. And we sincerely hope that your school systems found ways to do this effectively. Before the school year ends and to help educators target student learning needs and mitigate the impact of the crisis on learning, it's more important than ever to obtain objective screening data to evaluate student performance and growth. Teachers know their students, but even in the best of times, high quality screening data provides further insight into where students are at and what level of support they need to meet expectations. Distance learning reduced the level of teacher-student interaction, which makes it more difficult to know where students are at and elevates the need for screening data. I'm going to show you how screening, how FastBridge screening and reporting can be used to evaluate the impact of the COVID crisis on student learning. And you can hold on this slide for a second. Um, <clears throat> Under normal circumstances, the questions we typically want to address with screening, spring screening is, how much did our students benefit from instruction this year? And who has met the benchmark? Under the current circumstances, with all the disruptions to instruction, the questions may need to shift to things like, how is the COVID crisis impacting student learning? Which students made little or no growth since winter? And are we preventing the COVID slide? The mechanisms to address all of these questions are the same, but with important caveats. Is remote testing valid? This is a very reasonable question to raise, especially since remote testing really hasn't been attempted on such a large scale. Fast bridge assessments employ standardized administration scoring procedures and are validated using those procedures. There are many ways validated validity could be compromised, but what we know from research is that adherence to standardized procedures and minimizing distractions are key. Under normal circumstances, and when all procedures are followed, the teacher-led assessments provide optimal conditions for students to perform their best. As students get more accustomed to formal testing and interacting with digital technology, the FastBridge computer-based assessments are optimal for group administration proctored by trained staff. But what about remote testing? FastBridge content experts have provided guidance for how to validly administer both teacher-led and computer-based assessments. The information can be found in the knowledge base which within the system by searching the term COVID. There are several articles addressing distance-based assessment. Here, I've listed some common threats to the validity of remote assessment. Not adhering to the guidelines is very intention intentionally at the top of this list. We know connectivity can be a problem, especially in homes or areas where high-speed internet connections are not available or are unreliable. So you must be on the lookout for these during the administration. Motivation could be a factor, but there are ways to mitigate this. For computer-delivered testing, clearly communicate the time for testing to all your students and their caregivers, inform caregivers of the importance of screening 
keeping the area where the student is testing relatively free from distractions, and make sure they know the guidelines for proctors. For teacher-delivered assessments, on the other hand, the one-on-one -on -one testing scenarios, we believe that the presence of the teacher, even those remote, will likely be sufficient to maintain motivation. Is learning impacted? The big question on the minds of most educators is whether or how much learning is being impacted by the COVID crisis. The question can be posed at many levels, individual students, virtual classrooms, schools and districts. The FastBridge Group Growth Report can be used to address the question at all levels. Here's a snippet from the Group Growth Report. The change in a student's performance from one screening period to another is the lens through which we see learning progress. The Group Growth Report includes individual screening scores from each screening period. These are the scores enclosed in the box on the left. Adjacent to these scores are the gr growth scores and corresponding growth percentiles, which are color coded to aid with interpretation of the growth scores. This report also includes many other features to help educators evaluate performance and progress towards end of year performance goals, but I will not go into the details of those at this time. Here is a snippet, another snippet from the group growth report, and I've enlarged it so you can see the individual growth scores. FastBridge reports all growth scores as a rate of improvement score. The rate of improvement, or ROI, indicates the amount of change in the student's performance from a prior screening period. It is reported as the average weekly change. Here we see that the student's performance improved by about seven tenths of a point per week. You may wonder whether seven tenths is a good growth rate, and until you've studied the growth rates of many, many students, it would be very difficult to make that judgment from the ROI alone. That is why we place the national growth percentile right next to the ROI. Here we see that the 0.69 ROI corresponds to the 29th national growth percentile. In other words, this growth is higher than the growth rate of 28% of the students in the population on this test and at this grade level in the national sample. It also means, though, that it's lower than 70% of the population growth rates. And it is below the national average of the 50th percentile. Together, these points, point, together, these data point to a, a below average growth rate. So let's talk about the basics of interpreting growth. As previously mentioned, growth is reported as the average weekly rate of improvement. It shows how much a student's score changed from one screening period to the next. FastBridge also reports growth rates across the school year from fall to spring. So we have fall to winter and fall to spring growth rates. Growth rates are labeled to facilitate interpretation. The categories are flat, modest, typical, and aggressive. I'll say a bit more about these categories in the next slide. It is important to note that growth is not telling you about a student's level of risk. Risk is about a student's level of performance in a specific screening period. Growth is about the rate of progress across screening periods. In other words, a student may have an aggressive growth rate from fall to winter, but still score in the, quote, some risk level in the winter. It is also possible for a student to be at low risk and have flat growth across seasons. This slide shows the growth categories used in the FastBridge system and how they're defined. Growth categories are defined by growth percentile ranges. We use percentile ranges to provide a consistent interpretation across FastBridge assessments. And this is particularly important because FastBridge has a rich array of assessments and growth rates vary quite a bit across assessments. The lowest growth category, labeled flat, corresponds to the first to the 15th national percentile. This range can include negative growth or declining performance, as well as positive but low growth rates. What is important to keep in mind 
is that growth in this range is unexpectedly low. Growth in this range should be a red flag for educators to do further analysis as to what is happening with the student. The most likely explanation is the student is not benefiting from instruction as much as they should. That said, in some cases, low growth rates may signal a phenomenon known as regression to the mean. This is a possibility when the prior growth rate, let's say from fall to winter for the student, was in the aggressive category. So if they had a really high fall to winter growth rate, our analysis of growth rates show that they're more likely to have a lower growth rate from winter to spring, which could also be shown in the fall to spring growth rate. So if the fall to winter growth rate for the student was in the aggressive range and the fall to spring is in the flat range, regression to the mean may be part of the explanation. How do I know if learning was affected? To recap, review the growth percentile for each student. Growth percentiles less than 16 are rare and indicate unusually low growth. If growth is in the quote flat category, in other words, from the first to the 15th national growth percentile, review other growth scores for the student. Begin with the fall to winter growth percentile. If that growth rate is aggressive, the low growth rate may be a combination of regression to the mean and interrupted learning. If other fast bridge screening assessments were administered, review those growth rates. If growth on other fast assessments is also low, this is converging evidence of a problem. Finally, be sure to rule out other factors that may have impacted the integrity of the assessment, such as connectivity problems. This slide shows the tabs at the top of the group growth report. The tabs are used to configure the report to address a range of important questions. For now, I just want to point, to you, point you to the end tab, which is the end of the period tab um, at the top of the screen. By default, the end period will, current, will be the current screening period. So if you ran this report now, it would default to spring. So to obtain the fall to winter growth data, which is important contextual information to interpret uh, fall to spring growth, select winter from the drop-down menu. Just a couple further notes. We recommend using the national, the national growth norms labeled growth by all. So if there, you looked at the next drop-down, there would be other categories in there, but growth by all is the growth rate that we recommend you use for this, this kind of analysis and the benchmark for color coding for evaluating learning growth. So you can either look at benchmarks or norms, but we recommend using the benchmark color coding and the growth by all for the growth rate. This slide highlights a couple features. Um, first is if you look at the right um, side of the slide, you see a kind of a blue box around something that looks like a minus sign. When this is not clicked, it, there's a plus sign there, and you can click the plus sign to get more information on the student. So the, when you arrive at this report, there's less information than is presented currently on this report. You click the plus sign on the right side of the report and it expands the report to include other information and the critically important growth of data that you need to evaluate the impact of um, possibly the COVID crisis on student learning. Another great feature of this report is the sorting feature. Each one of these columns can be sorted individually in ascending or descending order. So to quickly identify students with low growth rates, sort, the, um, sort them by either by the growth percentile or the growth score. So both of them will give you basically the same information. Um, here we show sorting on the growth percentile column. And what you can see here is the first six students have very low growth rates and further analysis is recommended to determine whether this growth rate is an artifact of regression to the mean or a lack of fidelity of the screening process or, more likely the case, some interruption in their learning process due to the COVID crisis. The actual growth score indicates whether no growth, the actual growth score, so that's the non-percentile score, the ones that you see like minus 0.21, minus 0.235, and so on. That indicates whether no growth or regression and, and performance has occurred. So in other words, um, 
again, these categories can range from negative to positive growth. But when you see negative growth, you can be even more certain that there's probably been some regression due to the uh, interruption to instruction. Are we preventing the COVID slide? I would say this question is best assessed at the group or system level. This snapshot highlights the top middle section of the group growth report. It shows the percent of students in each of the four categories, flat, modest, typical, and aggressive. And what it can tell you is that a typical pattern, one that matches the national norms, would have 15% of the students in the flat category, 25% of the students in the modest category, and the remaining 60% divided across the typical and aggressive categories. Here we see only 27% above the modest category. In fact, we see no, no student in the modest category, but we see 27% aggressive, but 27% or none of the typical, but 27% above modest. Compared to the average of 60%, this indicates poor overall growth and suggests the COVID slide is not being prevented. Um, as a rule of thumb, if more than 50% of the student growth rates fall below the typical category, so that's the one that you can't see any value here because there are no students in that category, but so there's the two low categories and the two uh, higher categories. If more than 50% of the student's growth fall below the typical category and the two lower categories, it is reasonable to assume that growth has been negatively impacted. That's a rule of thumb. An even better method is to compare the percentages to the fall to winter period. So look at your fall to winter growth rate percentages for these categories, and then rerun the report for fall to spring. If the percentage of students below the typical level increases, so the percent in the lower two categories increases by 10% or more, learning has likely been impacted. So these are two strategies you can use to evaluate the impact, if any, of the COVID slide. And that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was really helpful. Um, I am Dr. Rachel Brown, and I am the Senior Academic Officer with FastBridge. And I'm going to talk about how we can act on the data. Um, and in essence, um, our goal is to help teachers prevent the slide if possible. Um, as John shared, there certainly are some data indicators that will help us know if uh, the, a slide has occurred but we may not have full robust data to recognize that for a number of weeks to come. At this point then, I want to reiterate that quote that Sarah shared at the beginning about how now is not the time for us to lower standards for students. One of the research findings that goes back many years that's been very robust is that students tend to either rise or fall to our expectations. And if we change expectations for whatever reason, there's a good chance students will adjust their behavior or performance around those expectations. For this reason, if we wanna prevent the COVID slide or any type of learning loss, we need to maintain standards while providing effective supports and good instruction for students. So I want to take a look at two different students and have us think a little bit about the extent to which these students are engaged in learning. Because the focus that I'm going to share is ways that we can optimize student engagement in learning while it's being provided virtually. And so you're going to see photos now of two different students one here um, and then the other one. And I think you can probably figure out the student who is more engaged in learning. The student on the left is providing some really good behavioral <laughs> indicators that he's not interested in participating in that learning session, whether it's online or however it's delivered. This is a student whom I would see as not very engaged. The student, the picture of the students on the right, but in particular that little girl, is a student who's very enthusiastic about engagement and participation in learning. 
And this is a student who's likely to continue to show up to online sessions and participate in all of the things the teacher asked her to do. That alone could have a huge effect on whether or not students make effective learning gains during the time when virtual instruction is being provided. So let's look at these students a little more carefully in light of some data about their growth in learning over time. Now on this slide, you'll see our little friend who does not appear very engaged has quite a low growth percentile. So think back to what John was sharing about how we can determine the extent to which a student is making effective learning progress. And in this case, if we look at students' curriculum-based measurement of reading scores, and we can see their screening scores from fall to spring, we have some information on the amount of growth. Now, it's certainly the case we can't know just from these data whether or not this little guy's difficulties with reading were entirely a result of the COVID situation or other factors. But what we can see is that in this case, this student's growth percentile, which is at the 13th, is substantially below how much growth we would want for any given, this is a second grader, any given second grader, in order to be ready to come back to school in the fall and be on track for meeting the next grade's learning standards. You'll see there also the predicted store, score for a student, um, for this student is 86, which we know is going to put that student at some risk for um, difficulties with reading performance, but the goal is 101. Now we can compare that to our very engaged student who raises her hand at every moment and is just eager to do any and all learning activities that she can. It is the case that she started with a fall score that was higher than her classmate and her spring score also came in as a very strong score and she is in a typical growth percentile. She is making the gains that we want for every second grader to make. And it's pretty clear she's very actively engaged in learning. And we can see that based on that trajectory, her predicted score is well above the um, and end of your benchmark. And in fact, she has a higher goal simply because she is making such good gains. Knowing something about a student's growth over time prior to COVID can make a big difference in figuring out which students might need more attention and care and your help to get them engaged in learning. Now we're gonna look at ways to foster student engagement. And I've identified four specific things that are well-known, well-researched ways that teachers can help facilitate student engagement that is likely to build their learning outcomes while they have fun, quite honestly. So we will look at each of these four variables in turn because we know that building relationships, attending to student motivation, making sure students can access what um, is being asked of them and the specific activities that are included are all variables that will have a clear effect on student learning outcomes. So in terms of relationships, one of the first and foremost things to do for all students, but particularly students who have not been engaged with online learning is to reach out to them and take time to connect. Um, taking that extra time to let the students know that we care about them is more important than ever before during this very unprecedented time in US public education. There's a long body of research indicating that if just one adult shows a child that he or she really cares, it can have a very significant effect on that student's long-term resilience and success. During this time when at-home environments are likely somewhat stressful because parents are being pulled in so many directions, 
children really need teachers who reach out and let them know they care in ways that go well beyond that whether or not the student is completing the assigned activities. And so find ways to reach out to students separate from just sending home reminders to turn in, to turn in homework. This can include weekly emails, just supporting them in various activities and or commenting on how well they've done in the past on various um, school assignments. Also facilitate ways for students to connect with each other. Just as we're all desperate for more social interaction, students are as well. Some students may be naturally moving in the direction of reaching out and communicating with each other via social media, but we can't assume that all of them are. Facilitating student-to-student -student interactions as well as reaching out to them individually to check in and make sure they're okay and provide some positive feedback to them is really important during this difficult time, just so they know that there is a caring adult who's connected to them and wants to help them be successful. Another factor that's important in thinking about how to facilitate student online learning is motivation. So I'd like you all to think about what motivates you. What are the things that help you get up and go do your job each day? And I'm pretty much talking about in a normal situation where you would get up and go to your school. Um, social acknowledgement is often something that we really appreciate. It feels good when somebody says, hey, you did a great job. Often we also appreciate peer esteem when we know that our colleagues appreciate us and admire us for the work we're doing and that we can collaborate together to support students. In general, praise really helps to keep us motivated and engaged in doing our jobs. Teaching is a very hard profession and getting regular praise and recognition for our hard work is even more important. Of course, money can play a role too, Few teachers go to work without you know, the benefit of a paycheck. So all of these are things that could be highly motivating for anyone. Well, it's the case that these things can be motivating for students as well. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how students can be motivated by the same things that motivate adults. Now, I recognize that money may not be a viable option, but we're talking about how we can support motivation for students. However, there are many ways that we can pay attention to motivating variables as we think about facilitating student engagement. Many educators might assume all students really like working on computers and that it's very natural to them. This, however, may not be true. And therefore, it's important to think about if being on a computer itself is going to be enough motivation for kids to want to attend and participate in learning sessions online. Other things could make a big difference, such as acknowledging their hard work and giving them praise for just being there, just getting to the session. That's something that we need to praise often because there could be variables that are challenging for them if they have to share devices with their brothers and sisters. So keep in mind that knowing what motivates a student is really important in fostering engagement. This is also why having made relationships with students and knowing something about what they enjoy, what teams they're on, what sports they follow, what other activities are important to them, and including that in your activities, as well as in your um, discourse with them can make a big difference. One type of motivation can include setting up learning activities that include some surprises, some mystery items. And so uh, some folks refer to these as finding Easter eggs. In other words, um, say to students, I want you to be on the lookout and see if you can find the mystery item or notice when I do such and such while we are doing this activity. Children in general love it when grown-ups make silly mistakes. And so including that kind of novelty in learning sessions can be very helpful 
because it's going to keep them tuned in and engaged to find and notice this, but it's also going to provide them with humor and a bit of good fun. Another very important thing to think about as we think about engaging students is access. And there are many aspects to this access component. Um, there's the basic access issue that relates to whether or not they actually have the devices as well as the internet access to be at the online session. And I know most schools have spent a great deal of effort to make sure all students have some kind of access if there is an expectation that students will participate in online learning. As I mentioned earlier, there could still be lingering challenges for some students relative to access in relation to whether they have to share devices with siblings or if time issues become a challenge simply because they have other in-home responsibilities. Particularly for middle school and high school students, there may be times when they are responsible for giving care to their younger siblings. This could be an access issue because they would be torn between attending a learning session and providing care for siblings. Knowing about these variables, again, as a result of relationships, um, can make a big difference in knowing when students are more likely to be available, as well as the kind of activities you're going to assign to students. Before we talk more about activities, though, I also want to talk about a different kind of access. And this is the access to the actual learning content. What kinds of activities we ask students to do, whether online or on campus, can have a huge role in whether or not they're able to complete them. And sometimes I call this the Goldilocks principle, because we need to find that sweet spot of activity that is at the level the student is ready to learn. We also call this the instructional level. And you'll see here there are three different math problems. The one on the far left we can describe as too easy, for many students at least, because it's a very simple math problem. And if a student is well beyond basic sums, that wouldn't necessarily be useful for a learning activity. In the middle there, we see a more moderate type of math problem that involves multiplication. And that might be the just right fit or difficulty level. On the right, of course, we see a problem that's substantially more difficult. That's actually the quadratic formula. Um, the message here is that it's very important we know each student's instructional level so that we can match what we are using for instructional activities to what they are ready to learn. In school, we might pitch some of that content at a slightly more difficult level because we're there to provide them more support. When we're providing online learning activities, it probably makes sense to pitch the difficulty level not quite as difficult as you might do at school because the students will be doing more work independently. So think about whether or not the content of what you're assigning is something that's accessible to students and make sure it fits that Goldilocks principle of not too hard, not too easy, but just right. Finally, we're going to talk about the kind of activities and what happens during online learning sessions. And there are four things that I would like for us to talk through that are important so that students will be able to optimize learning. These are the frequency, duration, pacing, and students' opportunities to respond during instruction. The frequency of those lessons has to do with really how many days a week will they happen. And we know that learning is not going to be at the same schedule as it is when we're on campus. So as you think about fostering engagement and having students be there and be engaged in lessons as much as possible, make sure you create a regular schedule. 
we do know that students will benefit from a regular schedule of when various learning activities will happen. This could be daily, three times a week, two times a week. It really depends on the content as well as what you know about student availability and school expectations. One thing to know is this, in this particular time, it may be that less is more. This means that you might have fewer sessions, but they are of better quality and in which students are more fully engaged. Duration is another thing to think about. Longer is not always better, and that's probably very true right now. So think about brief and frequent as being very friendly aspects to foster engagement. This is not just how often or many days a week you meet, but how many um, times during a given lesson you might do a certain activity. Mix it up. Have there be many different shorter activities during a lesson so that students can stay optimally engaged. This also will provide excellent practice time and help students to maintain their skills over time. Also consider pacing. In terms of pacing, this has to do with how much you're gonna cover in what amount of time. And it really pulls together the frequency and duration considerations. And one thing that we know is that having spaced practice is gonna optimize learning more than massed practice. This means that if you provide more frequent but shorter lessons during which students are able to be fully engaged, overall, their learning is likely to be much better. Finally, think about opportunities to respond. This is a very important piece of engagement because it is in responding and engaging with the teacher and others that students are going to make their biggest learning gains. Some of the ways of doing this include for each and every activity that you plan during your online lesson, have students participate together and respond together through things like choral responding. This means that instead of calling on one student at a time, all the students respond to questions or queries. This helps make sure everybody's engaged at the same time. Also, always provide immediate feedback. Give them that feedback right away so they know whether or not the answer was correct or incorrect, and then tell them what that correct answer is. Help them learn the right answer. Make it fun. Um, this is a really good time to use humor and those kinds of methods to help students stay engaged so that they want to show up to lessons and know that their participation there is both valued as well as good for learning. There are some additional resources that you might find interesting relative to how to foster student engagement in online learning. And two that we recommend are, a, it's a video series by Dr. Anita Archer. The links for them are listed here and will be within the um, download slides for this presentation. And basically these are much longer videos about the principles I've shared with you today, which are well-known, highly effective ways to engage students and support their learning. Thank you, Rachel. Um, when you were talking about choral responding, I was thinking about some of the great ideas I've heard from educators that I've spoken to about how they're using choral responding in a virtual environment when audio with 15 third graders doesn't necessarily work well. And they mentioned things like, um, having students write things on um, like yes or no or A, B, C, D on um, on paper and then kind of holding it up to their video cameras and, and different things like that. And so there are fun ways um, to do that type of thing, as you as you mentioned. Thank you so much. So this spring, we've received some questions repeatedly that we want to spend some time discussing. 
As we jump into these, um, one I want to highlight that I noticed in the questions coming in has been around um, how to conduct screening this spring when you are in a virtual setting. And so some of your schools may have decided um, to universally screen this spring, and some may have already decided not to. Um, some of you may be still considering it. Um, if you are considering it, we or if you've decided to universally screen but you haven't yet done so, we recommend going back into the knowledge base for FastBridge and finding the link to a webinar that we did about a month ago now, Rachel, would you say? Yes. Around screening um, remotely in screening, conducting screening in a virtual setting. And so I believe that we're also going to post that in the chat box. Um, Lynn will post a link to that in the chat box here. You can find it in um, in the knowledge base as well if you'd like. Um, if you'd like more information about that, that video about halfway through, I want to say it's in the um, 29th minute of the webinar. It demonstrates how to conduct um, a teacher administered assessment in a virtual setting, and so you can see a demonstration of that about halfway through that webinar. So we are going to address some questions that we've received repeatedly and then absolutely try to leave at least five minutes for, um, for additional questions from, um, from you. So one question that we've received repeatedly is what about students who haven't been screened because they haven't been online? Um, we've been asked um, in every school that we've talked to about this concern. So for a variety of reasons, there may be students that you are unable to screen. And frankly, we may not know the reason why some students are online. Um, if there were students in my class that hadn't been logging into our learning systems, haven't been responding to contacts, and haven't been attending small and large groups, we obviously would want to continue to reach out. Um, some of the time, we may not know why they aren't participating, and if, but if we do know, we can try to mitigate that. So most schools are providing hotspots and devices to students who may need them to access instruction. Um, other times, it may be that a student is not interested in the learning, as Rachel discussed. By using some of the strategies that she um, that she suggested, you may be able to engage a student who doesn't complete daily work to join you to listen to you read a book with them, maybe. Or you may have an online trivia game um, for your class about a topic that you know is enticing to, um, to a specific student. And so the big idea here is that no data is still data, right? We want to make sure that for those students who were not able to screen um, because they're not they're not engaging with us we want to try to find ways to engage with them um, and show them that we care obviously um, and want to and want to um, support them during this time another question that we've received um, several times is around benchmarks and norms so we've been asked if we can use benchmarks and norms with our remote screening data and to answer this question i'm going to ask john to jump in all right so obviously it makes sense that educators are concerned about how to interpret scores given the substantial disruption to instruction. Uh, and the short answer to this question is yes, the norms and benchmarks are still valid. But let me provide some context. Uh, fast, first of all, FastBridge norms were derived from empirical studies and so were the benchmarks. The benchmarks were derived from studies that used statistical methods to assess the accuracy of the assessment score at classifying students relative to end of grade performance on well-established standardized assessments. The cut scores for some risk and no risk were selected to optimize that overall accuracy. So we selected a point along that distribution that optimizes the accuracy. Uh, the risk score was further divided into two categories, a high risk and a some risk range. Thus, the risk categories are to be interpreted from a criterion referenced point of view, where the criterion is well-established expectations of year-end reading and math performance. Additionally, a large corpus of research has shown that students classified as low risk are likely to meet end-of-grade performance expectations in schools that implement research-based core instructional programs with fidelity. Students at some risk typically require additional instructional support beyond core instruction to stay on track, and the research shows that students at high risk require intensive support to get back on track. So this interpretation doesn't change even with the circumstances. What is likely to change, though, is the percent of students identified as at risk, and this percentage is likely to go up for most schools. Um, because the preponderance of evidence showed that the risk categories aligned to the 15th and 40th national percentile, and this is what's shown in this graphic here, this is a snippet from our um, benchmarks and norms uh, 
area in the training and resources part of the FastBridge system. But because these benchmarks tended to align closely to the 15th and 40th national percentile, all the FastBridge risk categories are defined that way. These levels are robust, thus tailoring cut scores to each measure generally does not have much impact on accuracy and it comes at the expense of a more complicated system. So if we had different cut scores reflecting different percentiles, we might improve precision a little bit, but it's gonna make the system much more complex. So we just said simplify this 15th and 40th national percentile, and these are very robust and supported with uh, research that's been conducted with MTSS programs for the last 20 years. Uh, the national norms are based on carefully selected samples of students um, whose scores represent the composition of the national school population on gender, race, ethnicity, and free or reduced lunch rates. They describe performance under typical school and classroom settings, of course. While there is nothing typical about the current situation, knowing how a student's performance compares to what is typical is the best way to determine how impacted learning is under these unusual circumstances. Uh, next slide. So then the other question is, should I adjust the benchmark? I already hinted at this answer, probably pretty much said the answer, but to be clear, we say, no, don't change the benchmarks. Adjusting the benchmarks to account for the likely performance decline only masks the level of need. And this is pretty obvious, right? And there's a large body of research that shows that performance declines, that performance declines actually when expectations decline. Also, keep in mind that FastBridge reports local norms and by definition, those local norms will reflect the impact on dis of distance learning on the, and the disruption to instruction. So your local norms will fall and rise with the effectiveness of your programs. And so you can still use the local norms to look at the overall percentage of students that you can serve in different categories, but they're gonna vary now more relative to the national norms. And lastly, I would say that a lot of schools we know use custom benchmarks. And to really understand your data and where your students are at right now, it's important to maintain continuity. So you need to look at and maintain those custom benchmarks that you established in the fall so that you can evaluate performance against what your original expectations were to see what the impact of this situation has been on student learning. And that's all. Thank you, John. Um, the last question that we wanted to address before we open it up and address your questions is around cheating. So we've been asked, what if a student cheats on their universal screening assessments? So in other conversations, we've been asked that. Um, we obviously have a lot less control over the testing environment when we're conducting these assessments um, virtually. We recommend addressing this proactively as opposed to waiting until cheating occurs to address it. So we will recommend two primary strategies to use. The first is to um, use the rapport and trust that you've already built with students um, to explain why the assessment is important, what it will and will not be used for, and why students need to take them with the same rules as they follow when they're in the classroom. Mutual respect that you've built with students throughout the school year will take you really far. Um, additionally, we recommend ensuring parents understand the purpose of these assessments um, and why it's important that they're taken in a standardized manner as they have been in the fall and the winter. If parents understand that it's not being used for a grade, um, these assessments aren't being used necessarily to determine class placement or other things that they may be anxious about, um, they'll be able to support you. And so think about the concerns that your families may have and try to proactively address those prior to screening as well.